All right, so hopefully you guys were able to visualize kind of what was going on here. But if you were having trouble, then cool. Most organic chemists do. And that's why we came up with this system that I'm about to show you. And this system is called the curved arrow method. And it helps you track exactly which electrons are moving where in the compound, okay? All right, so I don't want you guys to be scared of this curved arrow system, okay? Because it's actually a very simple concept and it's here to help you. All a curved arrow is used for is to help you keep track of electron movement, where electrons start from and where they move to. And hey, if you've ever gone on a hike, a road trip, or any other place that required movement, you'll be able to understand what a curved arrow is used for. Okay, so hey, say you went on a road trip from, from LA to San Francisco, and you wanted to show someone the route you took. Okay, so hey, what you could do is take out a map of California and a red pen. So, and let me just construct a really bad map of California. Okay, so that's supposed to be California, you guys. And hey, here's LA and here's San Francisco. Okay, so hey, what you can do is take out a map of California like this and a red pen, okay? Then all you have to do is draw an arrow from LA to San Francisco. And bam, you showed them where you started out and where you moved to. And this is the same thing in chemistry, you guys, except the curved arrow is showing where electrons started out and where they moved to. So hey, let's fill in our curved arrows for our CO3 2 minus resonance structures so you can see what I mean, okay? All right, so we said that this oxygen on the right used one of its lone pairs to form a double bond with that carbon, right? So if we draw a curved arrow starting from one of these lone pairs, it doesn't matter which, okay? I'm just gonna use these, this lone pair right here. So if we draw a curved arrow starting from this lone pair and point it directly in between the carbon and the oxygen like this, then this is just indicating that those electrons started from a lone pair position on the oxygen and moved in between the carbon and the oxygen to form a bond. Be careful though, you guys, not to point the arrow to the carbon like this. Okay, don't point it to the carbon like that or back to the oxygen like that, okay? You wanna make sure to point the arrow directly in between the carbon and the oxygen like we've done here in red, okay? These electrons are not moving onto one of these atoms, they are moving in between those atoms to form a bond in between those atoms. So, hey, make sure to point the arrow in the middle of the carbon and the oxygen like we've done here in red. So let me erase this in green because that's wrong. You wanna make sure to point directly in between the carbon and the oxygen to show that you're forming a bond there. All right, so we're saying that this oxygen used its lone pairs to form a double bond between this carbon and the oxygen, which you now see as a result in this second resonance structure, right? Here's the double bond it formed. And hey, you guys, if any of you are having trouble seeing how these two dots, these two electrons turned into a straight line like this, then just think about it for a second. Hey, what does this line represent right here? A bond, right? And what's a bond made out of? Electrons, right? So if you want, you can just draw those two electrons out. So instead of drawing this line right here, you can just draw those two electrons out like this if it helps you to see what's going on. Just realize that drawing out two electrons like this is the same thing as drawing out a straight line like that. They mean the same thing, okay? So, hey, let's fill in our other curved arrow. And we said that this oxygen on top decided to take back its electrons it was sharing with that carbon and stick it on itself as a lone pair like that, okay? So let's see how this happens. If we draw a curved arrow, starting from these electrons in between the carbon and the oxygen in this multiple bond, right? So hey, if we start from these electrons and point it towards the oxygen like this, then this indicates that those electrons started out as this double bond in between the carbon and the oxygen and moved to be a lone pair on the oxygen. And this is, and this is actually just the reverse of what we did with the other curved arrow, okay? So in this curved arrow, we used a lone pair to form a double bond. Here we're using a double bond to form a lone pair. They're the reverse of each other, okay? So, hey, I realize that drawing these curved arrows may be a little weird at first, but with practice, you should be fine, all right? Oh, one more thing I want to point out that students do a lot is to try and move electrons farther than they should. Remember, an atom is in, 
An atom is in control of its electrons. It can only use its electrons to make or break a bond with the atom right next to it. So if you notice, when we drew our curved arrows, they showed electrons moving from an atom to form a bond directly next to that atom. Or you saw electrons in a bond move onto the atom right next to it. Okay, so hey, you don't see electrons moving from like this atom to this atom over here. Only atoms directly next to that atom. Okay, so make sure you make a note of that. Oh, one more thing about curved arrows though, you guys. When you draw curved arrows, you can either draw single-headed curved arrows or double-headed curved arrows. Okay, so you can either draw single-headed curved arrows or double-headed curved arrows like that. Each head of the arrow, so this is a head, this is a head, this is a head, each head of the arrow represents one electron. So a single-headed arrow, also known as a fish hook arrow, represents the movement of one electron. A double-headed arrow, on the other hand, shows that two electrons are moving, okay? So if you notice in our example, I am using double-headed curved arrows. Double-headed curved arrows, okay? And I'm using double-headed curved arrows because two electrons are moving at a time. And these are the types of curved arrows you'll see until you get to free radical chemistry. Free radical chemistry will use fish hook curved arrows, okay? But we'll cross that bridge when we come to it, okay? For now, you guys, just think that electrons only move in pairs. They can't go anywhere without their bathroom buddy, okay? And hey, you guys had those, right? You pair up with a buddy to go to the bathroom to make sure you're both safe? Okay, well, whatever. The point is, electrons only move in pairs for now, okay? Okay, so now that you guys know how curved arrows work, we can now get back to our NO3 minus example that we stopped with, all right? So let me go and erase this real quick. All right, and let's get back to our NO3 minus example. And I promised that I'd take you through this example as if I myself was doing this for the first time. So that way, I not only get to tell you what to do, but more importantly, what not to do. Okay, so anyways, I'm going to start by drawing a Lewis structure. Okay? Now, before I even start trying to draw any resonance structures for this guy, I check to see if he's even able to have resonance structures. And I do this by checking for any electrons in lone pairs or multiple bonds. And yup, this guy's got both, right? A double bond right here and lone pairs on all the oxygens, okay? So after I do that check, I remind myself that the only thing that changes in resonance structures is the position of electrons. Only electrons move. Atoms do not move. So I know that the only thing I'm going to be doing here is moving electrons in lone pairs to make bonds or moving electrons in multiple bonds to make lone pairs, okay? So, hey, let me say that again to really drill it into your skull. The only thing I'm going to be doing here is moving electrons that are in lone pairs to make bonds or moving electrons that are in bonds to make lone pairs, okay? So if you still don't see that, don't worry, you will when we start drawing the resonance structures. Just keep reminding yourself that lone pairs will turn into bonds and bonds will turn into lone pairs as you draw these resonance structures, okay? Okay, so without further ado, let's just start moving some electrons around, okay? And what electrons am I gonna be moving? The ones in lone pairs are multiple bonds, never electrons in single bonds, right? Okay, so, hey, arbitrarily, I'm just gonna start with this oxygen at the top. He looks good to me, okay? So, hey, I see that he has electrons in lone pairs and electrons in a double bond, right? So that makes me think that we can either do one of two things with this guy. We can either move his lone pair electrons to make another bond with nitrogen, or we can move the electrons in his double bond to put another lone pair on oxygen, okay? So hey, let's check out both of these possibilities, all right? So hey, the first thing I said was that we could move his lone pair to make another bond, a multiple bond with nitrogen, right? So hey, he can choose to share his lone pair electrons to make a bond, right? Okay, so let me indicate this with the curved arrow.
And hey you guys, does my curved arrow here have one or two heads? Two, right? Okay, so this curved arrow indicates that these two electrons started out as a lone pair on oxygen and moved in between this nitrogen and this oxygen to form another bond. Okay, so hey, I drew this curved arrow to go right in between the nitrogen and the oxygen to show that it's going to form another bond, okay? So let's go ahead and draw what the resulting resonance structure would look like if we did this. And it would look like this. So hey, make sure to draw your resonance arrow connecting these resonance structures, okay? So it would look like this. And let me draw the bond that we just formed right here in blue, okay? Okay, so this lone pair will have shifted down to form this bond that I've drawn in blue. And this will also result in a plus charge now on this oxygen. Okay, so check the formal charge on oxygen if you don't believe me. But hey, sweet, you've just drawn your first resonance structure. But there are so many things wrong with it, I don't even know where to begin, okay? Well, hey, let's go with the most obvious thing, you guys. Do me a favor and look at this nitrogen. How many electrons are around that nitrogen? There's 10 electrons around that nitrogen, right? Two, four, six, eight, 10 electrons. And this totally violates the octet rule. And I don't remember me saying that nitrogen was one of the exceptions to the octet rule, do you? No, it wasn't, right? So, hey, atoms can't have more than eight valence electrons. So that's one thing that's wrong with this resonance structure. The next thing you should notice is the charge on oxygen that we added. There is a plus charge on oxygen. Now, hey, if you're gonna have charges, that's okay, but you wanna make sure that the negative charge is on the most electronegative atom, or if you have a plus charge, you want the plus charge to be on the least electronegative atom. So in our case, you guys, which is more electronegative, nitrogen or oxygen? Oxygen's more electronegative, right? It's more to the right on the periodic table. So hey, if there was gonna be a plus charge on this compound, what atom should it be on? The nitrogen or the oxygen? The nitrogen, right? But do we have the plus charge on the nitrogen? No, in fact, we removed a plus charge from the nitrogen and put it on the oxygen. So hey, if you couldn't tell that this was a badly drawn resonance structure from the violation of the octet rule, this should definitely tell you to back up and try again, okay? And hey, you guys, what do I mean by a bad resonance structure? I just mean that this is an unstable resonance structure. We call this a bad resonance structure because hey, NO3 minus the compound probably never exists in this form because it's too unstable. And so it's not accurate to depict it that way. It's like, hey, if you were trying to describe Mother Teresa, maybe, maybe she was mean to one person one day in her life, okay? But hey, would it be fair or accurate to say that Mother Teresa is a mean person? No, right? Because 99% of the time, she's a nice and caring person, right? And even if she did have a mean drop of blood in her, it would be a very, very minor part of her personality, okay? Just like this resonance structure that we drew. If this compound is too unstable to hardly ever exist in this form, then we don't even want to draw it, okay? Or hey, if you do draw it, you want to make sure to label it as being a very minor resonance structure because it is only a minor representation of what the compound actually looks like, okay? By the same token, a stable resonance structure is a good resonance structure and considered to be a major resonance structure because, it is, because it's a major representation of what a compound looks like, right? So anyways, you guys, no big deal. First time out of the gate and we crashed and burned on a bad resonance structure, right? But hey, who cares? That's what you're supposed to do. I want you to draw bad resonance structures. I just want you to be able to identify why they're bad so you can go back and draw other better ones, okay? All right, cool. So hey, we said that there was one of two things that we could do with this top oxygen. We said we could move its lone pairs to form a bond which ended up being a really bad idea, right? 